<laughs> What's wrong? So we've got this client. They're really funny about timings on things. Mm -hmm. And um, we need to generate some data at, um, <laughs> at 11 a.m. Okay. And the data expires at 5 p.m. Oh, boy. Now, I, now, I said, look, what time do you really mean? Because 11 a.m. is not 11 a.m. <laughs> to you know, it's not like, real. Yeah, it's not yeah. real. So mm -hmm. I said, look, the system entirely end to end works in UTC time, right? You you give it a date and a time, it's going to assume that that is UTC. End of. If you want that in local time, then obviously provide a conversion, right? Or we can provide a conversion in UI and things like that. Right. So apparently now it's five minutes past six. Google what the time is now, UTC, and you get five minutes past four. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't care what time it is in Brussels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the system is working on UTC time. End no. of, right? <laughs> you can quote all the information about the time in Brussels you want. That's fine. <laughs> and, and like, so the boss is like, well, it's not right um, um, because their data was supposed to expire at um, five o'clock. And I'm like, five o'clock when? Um, five o'clock where? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and he's like, well, five o'clock my time. And I'm like, well, okay, what's your time? And he's in France. And the clock's oh, not gone back yet. <laughs> so... <laughs> Five o'clock in France is already gone. Yeah. Um, because they're GMT plus two at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. But GMT, UTC yep. is yep. only it's only just gone four. Yeah. <laughs> so we're debating over this hour difference. And he's like, oh, it should just track. And I'm like, the system doesn't inherently know when the clocks go forward or backwards. <laughs> That's oh, why boy. I use UTC yeah. time because it's a specific it's point universal. Of time. Yep, yep, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So and it's just been a day of, of crap like that. And, I mean, Yikes. you and I have been talking about um, you know, how my system works and the, mm -hmm. this whole funding process mechanism, right? So another classic one. <clears throat> um, a client um, has at the moment a faulty process, which they um, specifically told us they wanted. So they send us invoice lines, okay? Um we send them back line items telling them how much has been discounted off of those invoice lines, but they want the line number. And I said, you can't do that. that. It's just faulty logic. Now, the way the system does it is it just does a really weird SQL join, joining everything up effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it just, you know, because the line number happens to be there, it dumps it into the result. But technically, like, I can't fund, if I've got a two line invoice, I can't, separately fund line one and line two that's the, that's illegal yep. <laughs> so i explained this to them and i said look putting the line number in there is just a logical error just don't do it right just mm -hmm. whatever you need to do on your end just make it happen so that the, you know the discount information is associated with the header because legally i'm not allowed to to separately fund like and i'm trying to enforce best not only best practice here but you don't want the eu knocking on your door yeah yeah <laughs> like right. they're not friendly about this stuff yeah that's right mm -hmm. so yeah it's just, it just been oh, it's a week of just stuff like that and i'm just sitting here ah. like yesterday um one of my team um he was like oh i spent six hours fighting this can you just fix it while we were in our meeting yeah and i said well when i'm finished with hassan i'll um you know, I'll, I'll go over it, you know, yep. and I'll, I'll, I'll have a look. It turns out that for whatever reason, he he did a get latest, but he didn't get latest. He, he got <laughs> half of latest for some reason, right? <laughs> so, and <laughs> as you know, I've been doing a major cleanup lately, mm -hmm. right? So I've, um, last week I did um, about 10 or 12 check-ins. Um, so it, there was about one to two per day. Mm -hmm. um, and every commit had um, about 100 to 150 files in it with right. just like minor fixes in them. There were silly mm -hmm. little things, but like 
it would be where I tell Visual Studio, hey, you see this thing here? It's in the wrong namespace. Move it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and that one change would just, just trigger like 100 files being updated. So I had a lot of like stuff like that. And for whatever reason, um, he didn't have the latest version. So he started committing extra commits to fix all the problems that weren't in the system. Yikes. And then he got to like, you know, midway through our meeting and he, and he ranted at me about it. And I said, okay, fine, fine. Let's, let's have a look. So I, I went and pulled the latest and it turns out there was a bug in it, right? There was a mm. method that was, mm. um, the controller had a method and it was referencing something that was in the service contract, but mm -hmm. the, that thing I'd retired from the service and just hadn't retired it from the controller. Mm -hmm. So I deleted three lines of code. Everything was bang on. Interesting. And, and he'd had like hundreds of files worth of commits. And I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> like, I can't see anything wrong. He, he diverged. He took, a, he took an yeah. earlier, <laughs> oh man, that's crazy. That's so crazy. He's, yeah, that, like this week has just been that. <laughs> and I'm just like, ah! <laughs> leave me alone. You see, yesterday <laughs> I was just talking to a bunch of people about system design and architecture. And I said to them, 80% of your problems are not going to be technical. It's going to be people. <laughs> so just yeah. get, get ready. You need to amp up on your people skill sets. It's not I even see, people. A, a reason I got into IT is, is because computers, when you're wrong, everything's massive. It's like this illegal problem, right? But yep. you know you can just fix it in two yep. minutes. When it's a people problem, Everything is blown out of proportion. It can take you don't years. Know why. <laughs> Some people will be mad at you for years. For yeah. years. There's no fixing for it. You can you can buy them gifts. You <laughs> can, you know, you can fix whatever they were mad about. Yeah. It's not happening. Right. I guess that's why a lot of people love, you know, tick more than, you know, dealing with people. But tick is also really complicated unless we can simplify it for people. Anyway, I don't know where the other guys are, but uh, here's the deal. You know, I've been doing. I wanted just. To, I wanted to make this session just so we can make a decision, right? We have to draw a map, right? It looks like Joe. Joe feels very strongly about this. You know, um, he wants to dive straight into the O data interpretation of the yeah. tokenization, right? And while I can kind of understand, because like the project is is kind of named OData Neo, right? So the expected output here is an OData specific thing. Mm -hmm. But I thought maybe what we do is we say, look, let's let's turn it on its head, and we say, no, no, no the project is Neo, and if you do Neo dot OData, there's a sub portion of it that is the OData portion, the I love parent that. portion. I like that. And yeah, so um, and that got me thinking. Maybe Neo is is like the um, if you like the 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 belt and braces route for your lakehouse mechanism. So it will begin with Microsoft dot Neo, mm -hmm. and Neo becomes a thing in in its own right, essentially, mm -hmm. of which O data is one piece of it. Yeah, and because I've been kind of thinking about um, a lot of the feedback you've been giving us lately around um, things that you want to achieve, and a lot of like the the other projects that you're involved in. Um, so there's a lot of things going on with um, OSSS and the standard and all this regex stuff. And, and I really sort of want to rewrite the .NET framework. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just a small task then, nothing major. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll show you why. I'll show you a very small example. Let me just show you. Okay. The underlying, so so it's, it's inherited, a lot of inherited. Not that there's nothing like, we can always be better. There's always a chance for improvement, right? I want to rebuild the way that .NET puts applications together as a rule. I, mm. I think that I think that the way that ASP.NET does it is good, but um, like separating Microsoft's DI container stuff from ASP.NET mm -hmm. um, would be an awesome start point because, like, to be able to just say, "Hey, I want a new DI container in my console app," and I, you know, I don't need to care about desktop or web problems yet. I just want to start building dependency injection because I'm going to do something complicated, right? <laughs> yep. So check this out. This is the email address attribute. That's the little annotation that you throw on top of your, you know, property in a model, and then ASP.NET okay. MVC will know. This is how it validates emails. Is Take valid. A just, just, just take a very good look at this implementation. <laughs> so as long as it's got an at sign in it, it's valid. 
Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Don't worry about so, .com, yeah. .net. Don't worry about any of that stuff. If it's null, it's valid. If it's a string... If no, it's, it's null, null, if it's null, it's a valid email. Think about that for a second. Yeah, if it's null, it's a valid email. If it's not a string, it's not a valid email. And if it contains an at, it's a valid email. That's pretty much all we're saying here, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and it must be... It must be the last character, or, or not the first character. Not the first character. So yeah. you must have at least two characters, and one yeah. of them must be an at. It's at. Wow, that's really bad. <laughs> I, I love how you're like, wow, that's really bad. <laughs> that's, wow, that's... So okay, I think... Who, who wrote that? People. I, I guess they were given like a really open remit and they looked into what makes a valid email and they just went, I give up. <laughs> so, so, so here's the thing. I have this really dear, someone who's really near and dear to my heart. His name is Todd Ostermeyer. He always says, he says, you can't actually validate an email because even if you structurally validated it, okay. like for instance, in some places for intranet, saying poll at Microsoft like this, that's a valid email. Yeah, because, yeah, you know, local domains, you don't need a .com, right? right? You don't right. need a TLD, as they, I think. But then, but then putting that rule, like, and I think this is where, where this is going, right? Hmm. But then there's a lot of rules. Like, if I do, it, according to this rule here, if I do dot at, it will pass. Yeah, yeah. Right? Oh, what if I did this dot com at... That would pass. That would pass. Yeah. So I think, so my idea is that I need to rewrite the entire .NET framework at some point in time. I call it not .NET. all of it. I mean, there's some good stuff in there. It's not all bad. Like, for instance, this implementation is okay. Is okay. Like, the string, if you go to the string implementation, hmm. I don't want to implement my own custom string class, right? The but thing Jeff? that annoys me about strings uh -huh. is whenever you're doing some um, I numerables is a classic one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can I iterate over this like it's an array? Oh, it's a string. Yeah, of course you can. It's like, no, no, that's a value type as far as I'm concerned. But it's not. <laughs> it kind of is and it isn't, you know? Right. And so you're stuck in this weird place with strings. I think yep. strings in .NET should be redefined as a value type and they should be kept as such but i um, i realized that maybe i've got a very limited understanding of what a string really is and what it really means in dot net so, you know I, yeah. I i think ideally if i rewrote the dot net framework yeah. it will ideally end up with similar quasi similar results but the implementation will be fundamentally different like for instance but is want... the issue there .NET or is it C Sharp? Because there's a really weird blurry line, isn't there, where something is different or something is very C Sharp and something is very .NET. You know? It's kind of like, like does, do strings behave functionally different in F Sharp or in, in VB? I mean, underlying, they're basically the same, right? Yeah, because it's the same framework. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, it's... .NET is so flexible and it allows for so much stuff to happen. I mean, right. have you heard about, um, was it Q-sharp that Microsoft come up yeah, with? Yeah, quantum. quantum computing stuff, yeah. yeah. That's basically a .NET programming language. Yeah. And I'm sitting here like, whoa. Yes. <laughs> you know, that, so that, the, the lady that runs this program, she's the smartest and the sweet. Oh, that's a good good reminder. I should pull her on my uh, podcast and have her talk a little bit about Q-sharp. Thanks for that. Yeah, I'll find her and I'll get it. Yeah, I'll get her on my podcast to talk. But here's here's the rules. Like, if I were to redesign the .NET framework, right, call it .NET Neo or .NET X or whatever the case may be, you know, I would change, you know, implementations in a way that is actually um, componentized. Like, for instance, if you have a type like a string, you sure as heck that you will have something called I string. Why? Why? Today, if you are trying to test drive a what I call a, a one-legged function, one-legged function is a function that doesn't have any dependencies. It does. It just does its own internal 
calculations and it doesn't call any external dependency. If you try to test drive that, it's hell. You're going to have to go pay for a for a commercial product like a simple simple uh, mock from uh, from uh, from Telerik to be able to mock internal .NET framework services. Why? Why would, I, I don't understand where you're coming from there. Like let's, what, let, what is inherently do. complicated about a string that requires an interface to be put in front of it? I'll tell you. Let's say you have a function. Let's call it foo. <clears throat> right? And this function, all it does is that it does a string interpolation. So you're saying return string, something like this, and you're basically saying, I don't know, uh, s split or something right and you're passing in some values in there okay okay i want to test when this guy throws an exception i want this guy to blow up when it throws an exception right today okay. you can't actually inject a, a clr native library capabilities and attach an exception to them you just can't Ideally, in the real world, I would have... Is that because of like internal or protected or private things inside the assemblies? It, it just doesn't, it doesn't have an interface. It just does, it's not implemented right. But are you, So I, I'm looking at that and thinking like, like when I test um, my OData APIs, right? I'm not testing OData. I'm assuming Sam's tested OData, right? Uh, and what I'm testing is the stuff that I've built on top of OData. So right. the same rule applies with .NET. When I'm testing my function, my foo function that I've built, I'm not testing string.split. I'm testing right. my usage of it. And and we're not testing string.split here either. We're testing how this function will behave if string.split threw an exception at you. How are you going to handle it? Right? So in order for me to see how my function, my own function, is going to handle it, I need to mock an exception that will be thrown out of string.split. Well, surely you would just give your function some input that would cause it to throw an exception, right? What if your function doesn't have an input? And even if you did, let's say here's string x, right? right. And for whatever reason, you already have your validation going on here. So there's your validation rule here is already making sure that x is in good format. But just because your input is in good format, it doesn't mean that this guy is not going to have memory leakage or some craziness happening in it that makes it throw an exception for whatever reason. And you need to guard and program defensively against that. How do you mock this guy? You can't. You're going to have to go pay money for it. Because the framework is inherently designed in a way that doesn't support that behavior in development. I'm clearly missing something about your thought process here. Well, uh, Hassan, so here's a two points. So one is um, which functionality do you, do we uh, verify? Do we, do we test? This I one. mean, we test the full or test the split? Full. Full. Yeah, cool. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So string dot split is assumed to have been tested by Microsoft because that's part of right. the, the framework. Yeah, yeah. That, so, so, yeah. I, I want to test how foo would react if this guy blows up. That's a part well, of foo. Surely you'd write a test that says, hey, should throw some type of exception. Right. And how and do then, I make when it does, you test the exception values, right? That's that's right. How do you make that exception happen in here if you can't mock this dependency? <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, oh, you're so you're saying specifically, you're, you're going to call that, and you want that string dot split to fail. Yeah, like let me just show you an example. Let's say in the real world you have return this dot storage broker mm -hmm. dot insert value x. Since this guy is a dependency, I can go in my test and say this dot storage broker mock, mock setup, and then my broker will throw an exception. Right? Why? Because I'm controlling the dependencies that are happening in that service. Right? Right. The .NET but you're, framework... you're saying it's a problem that you can't cause string.split to throw an exception? Yes, of course. I want to control this as a dependency so I can control the behavior of my function. Like, I am not testing this guy. I'm testing how my function would behave 
if this guy blows up? So I would give it some input that you know would cause that to blow up. Well, but you have validation tests as well. You won't so be let, able... Let's, no, okay, let's say instead no. of string dot split, it's x dot split, right? So mm -hmm. give it null. Give, give x null? Yeah. But you have a validation method here that won't let that go by. So if um, in this case, maybe we can uh, accept a uh, action or, or a function. Uh, like an action uh, in here? With a four. Action no, like just uh, accept a string and another fun uh, parameter as a function. Oh, another some... parameter as a function like this. Yeah. Function return, uh, accept a, a string and return uh, something. Object, right? Yeah. So well, and uh, well, now you uh, changed your contract just for the sake of testing. So yeah, so we, we change the change the uh, syntax of for method. Yeah, this is a little bit of an advanced topic. What mm -hmm. I was just trying to tell you is that mm -hmm. today, in order for you to do something like this, those Telerik folks they went and said, "Hey," and this is a real problem. I'll I'll explain to you in a bit. If you go and and find easy mock like this. They'll say, oh, pay me $400 to write a proper test. Check this out. Not this one. Easy mock uh, Telerik. Presumably, whatever Telerik is doing, anyone else could potentially still do, right? Because like, uh, I, don't, I don't know what they're doing, man. I don't know. They're doing something underneath, you know. So let me just show you what they do because it's, 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 it's a little crazy. Oh, it's called just mock. Sorry, not easy mock, just mock. I would bet that they're redefining string. Yep. So look what look what they're doing here. Check this out. They say, hey, you know that native type, non-public members, things like, let me just show you. They go here. Uh, this website is garbage. Um, let me show you. They go here and say, uh, let's say, mock, non but no, not this one. I want, they used to have date time in here. Oh, uh, yeah, there it is. Microsoft lib. Look, you know that date time native type? They make it blow up. I went to an event, a build event in London. Mm -hmm. And there was one of the, oh, who was it? Was it Scott? It was one of Hanselman? The, mm. No, no. The, uh, uh, Goodfree or someone like that. Mm. Oh, I can't remember who it was. But it, they, they were talking about doing this exact same thing. Because um, at the time, it was being discussed from a security point of view. Yep, yep. Huge where you could basically, you could write reflection-based code that allows yep. you to place pieces of the framework. And they're yep. like, is this a security problem? Yep, yep. Um, and Microsoft I've never heard the answer to that question. <laughs> so so Microsoft made, made something called fakes, Microsoft fakes, where yeah. you go and fake an entire library, right? So if you have Microsoft lib, you're going to go and use fakes, right? No, and no, th this was like they construct something at runtime Right. right, and then they'd go into that constructed thing and mm -hmm. redefine a piece of it, including yep. its private methods. Yeah, because at runtime, once you've got the object in memory, the behavior, if you um, do things like inject some C code that isn't yep. managed yep. into your reference, there you yep. can literally just say, Hey, pff, I don't care that this is a managed thing, I'm just going to rework it. Yeah, and then the framework will call your C code instead of. Yep. the the thing that was so there was a big thing about like how secure is the .NET virtual machine yep. and I don't know what has been the response since because I've, I've not really heard much about this but I've not heard any like massive security flaws coming out in like the .NET ecosystem saying hey it's it's no longer safe to run .NET code because right. C++ exists or something right <laughs> the, the other thing I just want you to understand that there's a bigger like here's the thing the standard 3.0 will be strict on not even using native framework uh, uh, types. Hmm. So your local code is really, really local code. Ideally, the ideal state is you that... You avoid that, right? Because at some point you've even got like value types. I mean, see, they're see native. That, <laughs> see, that's the thing. The framework itself needs to be rewritten to allow extending existing contracts into local ones. Hmm. Well, I can write, say, an extension method for integers, and then that becomes part of my code base, but is not part of the general .NET. 
Think about Ike variable, for instance, right? We don't yeah. own that code. So here's the thing. There's three types of code that exists in every application. These types are native code, the framework code, and then there's external code. Oh, you're using this library and they're leaking in their models into your system. And then you have your local code, the code that you wrote, right? These three components exist in any software you'll see. The trick here, it is to purify, like right now, standard 2.0, we're very strict about not letting external external models leak into your processing orchestration services. No go, I will shut down the PR and shut down the project. It's not gonna happen, right? So now we're at this second stage. The first stage of the standard would allow everything in. Native, external, and local. Let them come in, right? And now we are in the second phase. You guys actually are my seventh chapter. Like you are the seventh <laughs> group of engineer that I work with throughout the terms of 21 years. So as I am evolving and building this story, there is the there is the aspect of, let, let me just visualize this for you. Like right now, our code is not actually native. This is what I'm trying to, this is what I'm trying to implement with OData Neo. Remember how I said to you, we need all our models to be super localized so i can take the code and translate it into java python javascript whatever you want to do it and mm -hmm. somewhat it will be much easier without using existing native framework models but we'll come back to this one so if you know like this is these are your brokers right and these are your services and these are your controllers right i will allow you let's make the red to be external models so this is external external models this guy here and let's make the uh, let's make the blue or maybe the orange to be native models that's your framework .NET framework value task string integer all that and let's make the green to be your local models which are the good ones right the ones that you want to stay you know in your system right the original copy of the standard was all about oh let's have these here and here and here so here here and here they exist sorry they exist in every single layer and i'll just explain these layers i i don't know sam how much you read about the standard but you know you'll catch up real quick you're a smart guy so this is your integration layer and this is your service layer and this is your exposure layer. Could be a UI, it could be an API, it could be whatever the case may be, right? That was the standard 1.0. Oh, you have message queue broker message coming in. Oh, let me let all these models in. Today, we have strictly kicked out this guy out of this equation completely. And we said, oh, you can only use local or native models. This is another evolutionary process that's happening in the code that we're writing that's actually evolving our code and making it more solid. Because you have to understand, the reason why I'm very strict about this is that software now is controlling launching rockets to the moon. It can kill people. So if we're not strict on the principles that write software, this is why I'm being really, really, you know, kind of vigorous around, I need to make this through an exception so I know how my software is going to behave to towards it. But just hear me out. The next stage is to get rid of this guy. And the only way to get rid of this guy is to rewrite the framework. So how do I have a model that I have defined? So let's say I say, you know, class foo, and I want to give it a property. Um, if I say, okay, my property is um, of type I string, okay, I string is native. That mm -hmm. that's that's part of the framework, right? There, yeah, but no it's a contract. It's it's a contract that you don't have to be. That's right. I, I love that. I love what you just said. It's a contract, right? Mm -hmm. I want, like today, my hacky way of doing it is to go wrap that native model behind an integration component. So you, you're, you're taking, um, I, I can understand that like, I kind of like the object level, but when you it get works, right down to primitives, it, it becomes more complicated, right? Yep, because it works on I, the operational models but it doesn't work on the data carrier models like value task 
Yeah, like so if integer. I've got something, if I've got something like an integer, right? An mm -hmm. integer is literally just a definition of a number in in mm -hmm. memory. Mm -hmm. Well, does it matter if I've defined that locally or if that is defined natively? I would say no, because the way that I would define that locally would be the same way that it's defined natively. In then, the, then how do you I make it throw an exception? Like if you do int dot max, how do you make that throw an exception? Yeah. Do you want it to do that? Of course. That's how you make your software solid. These are the things that nobody looks at or talks about. That shit that I'm just telling you about right now. Anybody out there will tell you, oh, just catch an exception and throw it. Right? I, I think, yeah, software developers have got this very sort of blasé approach to things at the moment, haven't they? There's, I th there's I a think lot so. of coders out there that are like, oh, it's okay for now. You know, I'll, I'll fix it later. You know, That's not how I play. <laughs> That's not yeah. how I play. I know what you mean. Um, but then, there's, I mean, like in my position, for example, right? You know, I'm, I'm leading a dev team. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always got this pressure from the business to deliver something quickly. Mm -hmm. And th there comes a point at which you're balancing the, the time of the people that are working for you and, and your own time against the time that clients want you to spend on something. Right. And you have to have this, this principle that's like, I'm going to do the right thing as much as I can do the right thing. But doing coding well does often take longer than coding. Of course. Just throwing something together, right? Of course. And, building, and the building main... a stronger building takes a longer time than building a tent. Yeah, but then I'm sitting here thinking about, um, who was it? Uncle Bob said the yeah. only way to go fast is to go well. Um, yep. and, his, and his argument for that was, well, if you write it well, then in future iterations, you're going to have less of a, a problem yep. maintaining it. Yep. So I, I get that principle, but every business owner is like no you're not allowed to foot any upfront costs just deliver um yeah that's so, just that's when business is non-technical that's a death march for any software engineer yeah yeah don't don't work for a business a that is not technical this is why the most successful <clears throat> software businesses out there are funded and founded and driven by engineers google Facebook. The CEO used to be a programmer. Yep. That yep. kind of, yeah. Yeah. SpaceX, all of these places, they're successful because the top head, the top leadership writes code. It is funny because um, when I started my career, they didn't really have like um, computer science degrees. Like they were mm -hmm. sort of coming in slowly. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is 20 plus years ago. It wasn't that common. Like the big universities had them, mm -hmm. but not like the local ones. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was common for like, their, like the average developer to not have a computer science degree. Like they would mm -hmm. have some kind of qualification, but it would be something like an MCP, right? A Microsoft mm -hmm. cert. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then I'd, I'd sort of get into an IT department and nobody really knew how to manage programmers, right? Because the managers were all like business leaders. They come from like accounting or something. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so like managing a software life cycle, that was kind of unheard of yeah. because, you know, what's a software life cycle and things like Prince too is bloated. And it's, it's all about managing projects in general. It's got bugger all to do with it really. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and so like no one really knew how to run a dev team or to have proper like DevOps yeah. like we have. You don't, yeah. You don't have to look so far. We had Bill Gates right and then we tanked with steve balmer because he's not technical and then we had satya back yeah yeah right i have videos of satya nadella writing code you know wow. on video yeah 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 so so anyway back to this point just not to diverge you know or diverge from this you know this is the next step that's the next kind of iteration in the standard is where we go and say we need to come up with a model where even native models don't have access to your business logic and that's a very tough problem to have that's a very hard problem because either the framework itself needs to support extensibility mm. or we need to rethink our entire model I'm, I'm i'm already like i need to chill out a little bit because i have this lake house thing going on and now i'm talking about denativizing you know our components you know, and some other crazy ideas. Anyway, listen, you know, 
I just wanted this this session to be real quick just for us to make a decision. It doesn't look like Joe is going to be able to make it, but Sam seems to be on the same page like Joe, right? So Sam, just to, just to reiterate, you are voting for having the tokenization service be OData tokens aware in the sense that it knows that a a a, a single quote value single quote is one token. Yes. Okay. And and Paul, you're saying single quote value single quote is three tokens. I I would say in an OData tokenization scenario, no, I would say that's one token. But I, I would say that tokenization as we should understand it in the solution that we're trying to build should be a two step process. There should be generic tokenization followed by OData tokenization to allow people to build customized pipelines where they can rip out pieces they don't want and replace pieces. Or, you know, if they wanted just the, the OData bit, if there was some issue with it and they wanted to replace the way that we did the OData bit, they could and they'd still have a token stream to play with. You know, they, they wouldn't have to like start from scratch. My worry with putting them both together is that it's one, a larger component. Um, and two, if there's any aspect of that larger component that people don't like, they've got more to replace. So it deters people. And if they get problems with it and it turns people off the framework and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm always in favor of like the smallest unit of work that you can build, build that and then layer stuff or wrap stuff or, you know, Componentize, build pipelines or lake houses to to put stuff together. Sam, would you would you entertain the idea of putting stuff together on the O node service instead? We lost Sam. He's gone. He's back to Dubai. <laughs> Sam. <laughs> Sam, do you want to collect them back on the O node service? Or should we just do it on the tokenization? On the tokenization. Okay, Paul. We're going to have to come down to Sam and Joe. Because they are two and you are one. I can't... Cool. I, okay, I, pers okay. I personally want to do it one single token for every piece. But we need... I, I, I don't think I should vote. <laughs> 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 so okay we'll do it this no, way then because awesome. because we'll what's just your, what's your opinion my opinion i like what paul is saying to be honest mm -hmm. with you but but you know there's just as much weight on the other side with you and joe if nick or what was that guy from brazil who showed up a couple of times and then disappeared what was his Breno? name Breno. Yeah, yeah Breno. So, uh, if one of them could kind of give us the ultimate kind of balance, we would go one direction or another. But we're we're at an even number. That's why I hate even even numbers. Like I, if I you... think it's not a big deal because we can change it later. We can uh, uh, follow one direction. Yeah. What's what's wrong? What? Yeah, he's just fixing his camera because it's blurry. He's he's not telling you to shut up. I promise you. Logitech, man. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I mean, Sam. Hey, Sam. Tip, tip, to, typical uh, English guy, right? Just mu yeah. just sh yeah, shutting just... everyone up. <laughs> just uh. <laughs> oh, Talk to the hand. Time out. <laughs> or, 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 or pull or pull a Will Smith. <laughs> just... <laughs> It's fine. I'll apologize for it later. <laughs> did you see? Did you see his body posture when he get gave the slap? Like he went like, you know, it was like a ninja kind of. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, so... I, I mean, we will keep one direction and move on, and uh, uh, it's not a big deal because um, it's not it's just uh, because it's yeah, not... I know uh, we can add if we want to follow a post suggestion. It's easy. You just add another split for the whole uh, single code wrapped string. Okay, we can separate that. But before that, we can move on and can take that into consider as a whole and move on. Okay, let's. So go. I don't think about... it's it's a big deal. Uh, uh... So Joe came up with a good one, which was we build sort of tokenization my way, 
um, but then we layer into mm -hmm. the tokenization service the ability to um, to add conventions to it essentially so we can put the odata conventions into that and then if they're put in there then it becomes an odata tokenization process but if they're not put in there it's just raw tokenization that's joe's idea yeah so let's build uh, it this way let's joe's this thinking way. was then that by having that option to, t to take them out mm -hmm. you've got the best of both worlds but it also is a one-step process yes. which i'm in favor of as well because that actually makes the implementation in theory more compact um, so rather than having like, you know, a very long pipeline, we've got a much shorter pipeline that achieves the same result, but that shorter pipeline is also configurable. So I let's think that's the best of both worlds. Let's yeah. do it this way then. Like the code itself will have the OData conventions in it, but if people want to replace these conventions and make them just single tokens, then let it be. Yeah. Well, I mean, what happens if we want to replace single quotes with double quotes, for example, when we're doing our string literals? Right. You know, now we just, just we something just... as long as we've got that ability that's that's the only thing i care about really okay let's start doing that on friday then cool sam <laughs> good okay good all right guys <laughs> thank you so much talk to you later take care that was Bye. a short one yep Bye. yep take care